cemetery. Letting people connect to your device over US, with an untrusted USB device is really a pretty dangerous thing to do. So do you have to, what do you plug it in to charge up the capacitor? It charges from the USB port. Yeah. It takes the five volts and gradually builds up like a thousand volts and then yeah. <laughs> So it'll so, work for a little so while and then suddenly blam, your computer's broken and you say, gee, I don't know what's wrong with your computer. I'll take my USB stick and go home now. Yeah. Anyway, all right. So uh, this is the second part of attacking other users, some more cool tricks. Um, all right, so you can have, these are things that inject data into the client and confuse it. Now this one is kind of an old trick, but this is HTTP header injection. Suppose you put in something, like here you, you specify your language is English, and then that's used in the header to set a cookie, preferred language equals English. Now that would be fine, but if it's possible to inject line feed carriage return into it, then you can inject extra lines in the header. And if that's the case, um, you can inject another whole header. So you could um, put in any parameters you want here, like foo and bar. That would add another parameter called foo with value bar. So if you want to exploit this, you want to see if uh, percent zero %0D and percent zero %0A come back as characters in the line feed. And if they're sanitized, you can vary them in the usual way, double them, or add percent %25 for the percent, and that'll bypass certain cases. Now, the, um, then you can inject cookies. You could inject a whole cookie that the user didn't intend to be there, have another cookie, um, session ID equals something. Uh, then you can allow, you can now inject an entire web page, control the entire body of the account. You can change, you can add text to the web page, add JavaScript to the web page, redirect to another web page by changing the location. You can pretty much do anything if you control the header. And this is, I came across this years ago with the old web goat with uh, HTTP response splitting, which is one version of it. And uh, in that one, you put another complete page with carriage returns. So you're gonna have um, malicious, now here's the simplest case of it. The original, the original response has HTTP 200, okay, set cookie something. Then it has a bunch of original content down here. So what I do is I add content length which is my link, then I add 999 bytes of my stuff and the browser will ignore everything that comes after that. So I can erase their entire web page and put in a whole different web page, all by changing the parameter called uh, language, assuming that it'll let me put in a lot of characters and characters and line feeds and everything in it. Now this has been known for a while and it's been patched by almost every modern web server, so I hunted around for a while and then I just wrote my own. I just wrote a Python web server in like 20 lines that is stupid enough to fall for this. Um, so I can show it to you. So that's uh, attack, okay, and then uh, header. Okay, so there's the page that does it. So in a normal case, you put in a language of English, and I only run it through burp actually, it'd be easier to show it that way. So it's uh, Firefox, okay. Run it through 127.001. Run it through burp. Okay, proxy is running. I wonder where that annoying message is going to be. All right. So now it's attack. Okay. And then header. Yeah, yeah. I know my connection is not secure and I do not care. Um, Oh, going to be like, oh, it's advanced. Thank you. Good. All right. Good. All right. I would not have to use the direct URL that's not HTTPS. But is this nonsense? It's sending me to support. Okay. I must have a ton of these exceptions. All right. Finally. So now here I am. And let's just do the normal thing. I tell him to have English. It warns me I'm sending stuff over an insecure connection, which is true. Okay, because I had to go directly to the server to get to my server. It's listening on port 8888. This is how I cross languages. I'm running a Python server listening on 8888, and the form sends to this URL. So anyway, now it knows I'm an English speaker. So let's see what Burp made of that mess. Okay, here's Burp. And here's the get. So the request is down here. All right. So it sends the usual stuff, get, host, user agent, and all this garbage. And then the response is HTTP 200, language, English, Kennedy Enter, hello, English speaker. 
So this is just, and my script is incredibly primitive. My script ignores everything except the language in the first line. It doesn't matter what any of the rest of this is, and it always just returns that page, but whatever the language is, it puts it in there after not removing any dangerous characters, which is the way web servers used to be before everyone found out about this vulnerability. So this is the demo that I liked. So you add this garbage. And what this garbage is, is English, character turn line feed, content length 28, two character turn line feeds, then HTML body h1 owned, then HTTP 200 OK to start the next response. So let's watch that one go. You send that, now you're owned, and you shouldn't have seen the English speaker anymore. It worked when I did it before, but I don't, oh, because I did it in Chrome. I got to do it in Firefox, which I think is the one dumb enough to fall for this. Okay. So if I do it in Firefox, then I get honed and I don't even see the English speaker thing anymore. And that's because you can see it here, there. I told it my request is get language and the language is all this English percent 25 and all that garbage. And the response is now interpreted as one entire HTTP page here and another entire HTTP page here. Now, the way I did it this time, this second HTTP serves no purpose. The reason, that, because the only thing that mattered here was the content link 28, which caused it to stop processing at that point. However, this is the simple version of the attack. The more, this is because of a, putting in a new faced web page. The more complicated version is response splitting, which is what I've done here, where you now give two complete web pages reply. And the reason you do that is because you can now poison caches. And I think I got that picture. Yeah, here's the, the book goes through this in some detail. I didn't think it was worth worrying about because not too many people are vulnerable to this anymore. But the point is, if you have a proxy server someplace, like Cloudflare, that's making copies of your pages, you now send a request, and then you send another request, which you can, you can put two requests in the same HTTP session. You can put up to 100, in fact. And you can do it in the scripts, you may not know that. So you can have two requests, then this thing gives me a split response, and there's a third response here. So the second response actually ends up getting cached as a response to like the admin login page. And this one is ignored. So I can take the second response, which is under my control, and um, cause it to be loaded into a different page. So you can poison a cache. So some large group of people will see the wrong page, and you can steal credentials from them. It's just a way to make phishing even nastier, where they actually go to the correct URL, the correct server, and they still see the wrong page. Yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> is, it, is it possible to inject the Python code this way? Inject your Python code? Yeah. And do you buy I don't think so, because Python won't run directly in a browser. But you could put in JavaScript, and you could put in things like Flash, if they have Flash in the browser. Anything runs in the browser. As far as I know, there's no way to run Python in a browser, though. Well, yeah, but is, if this is crossover. Is this process in the back end? You said you're running a Python server. I am, but all my Python server is doing listening, requesting, and responding. It, none of the code actually ends up in the Python. Mm -hmm. And it used to be that Java servers really were this way, and they patched them. If I had ever been some common product that still had this vulnerability, I would have run that, but they're pretty much all wised up. So if you want to prevent this, obviously you could not put user-controlled data in the header. That would be nice. If you must, then you've got to use input validation, knowing what should happen, like how long the parameter should be anyway, like in language doesn't need to be longer than 15 characters or something. Or an output validation, block all the funny characters, like carriage return and line feed, so you can't inject them. That would do it. If you are vulnerable to this, you could also inject cookies. And there are other nasty things here. Um, there are a lot of apps that take uh, function that take parameters and put them in a cookie, like save user preferences. Um, and therefore, you might be able to set them, uh, the cookie itself might be the way you can inject more data. <coughs> but there's another one too. You can go change a cookie that was set by the app to be something else. And in fact, we're going to get here a little later. You can even take a cookie that was set over HTTPS and marked secure, and you can connect over HTTP and change that cookie, which is rude. So normally, that's not too important because it, they need to have a session number that you don't know, but there are conditions under which you can do something like change admin to yes and things like that in a cookie. Um, all right. So, um, and you can set a cookie on a target domain for any subdomain of the target domain or any of its parents. So if you're in a man in the middle, you can set cookies for an arbitrary domain. 
you can just take any HTTP request and reply with a 302 redirect so it goes to some other domain. Then when they go to that domain, reply and set a cookie. You can set a cookie, Amazon, Google, anything you want, if you're in the middle. And there's essentially nothing the app can do to stop this. Like cookies are a pretty miserable way to authenticate things, but that's the way it is. Um, and it's like, this is this whole category of layer two attacks, they're very powerful, and many people have said it's just, Dan Kaminsky said it's just a not a securable layer, the only thing you can do is keep people off your layer two. But it's not very practical to keep the attacker off your layer two, it's pretty easy to get on somebody's layer two. Physical proximity in a coffee house will do it, a shared server in a shared, in a cloud rack will do it. When I had a RapidSyn uh, server, I tested to see who else was on my same layer two and there were 178 other customers' servers on the same layer two as me. And I could have done anything to any of them. Um, and they could, and there's, it's pretty scary. Your firewall doesn't do anything. It's hard to stop layer two attacks. Anyway, so once you set a cookie, like okay, if you can change your logic, like use HTTPS equals false, um, client side code might trust cookie values and then use the cookie values to display things on the page and then you've got DOM based XSS or JavaScript injection. Um, a lot of people put tokens in a cookie and into a request parameter and compare them so you can control both. You can defeat anti-CSRF um, tokens. If you have a persistent XSS phone that only affects the same user, which means I can save something and then when I view it, it attacks me. That would seem harmless, but it's not really harmless because I take the victim and I feed them my cookie and now they're looking at my page and running my script. Um, session fixation is another one. This is, uh, see, the most secure thing to do is to create a new session every time anything important changes. But a lot of people don't do that. So one thing they can do is when you first connect to the page and you're not logged in, they issue you a token. And then when you log in, they elevate the privileges of that token and keep using the same token. Now if they do that, what I can do is trick you into using my token right from the start. And then I already know the token, then I wait for you to log in and elevate it, and now I'm in with elevated privileges. Um, so that's the game. First the attacker loads the login page and gets a token, then they feed that token to the user, then when the user logs in, they're using that token, now the attacker can just ride on their session and get in with that token. Um, all right, you, if you can't inject a cookie, you can put the token in a cookie, that's one way to do it. If the token is in the URL, just get them to click on a URL that contains a session ID you chose. Perfectly valid session ID for your session and now they'll log in with your session token. Um, some apps will let you add a token in the URL after a semicolon, which is kind of rude, um, but you can put a semicolon here and have it in there, which is not standard syntax, but some apps will fall for it. Uh, if you have a token in a hidden HTML field, you can inject it if you're vulnerable to cross-site request forgery. Anyway, so it, the same thing can happen even without a login. Amazon does this. I was going to make a big deal at the Wallace Heap about this, but I looked into it in more detail and I decided it wasn't quite that bad. But Amazon is not HTTPS all the time. It sets a bunch of cookies that are HTTP and a bunch that are HTTPS, and when you browse the site, a bunch of stuff is not HTTPS. But you can't actually purchase something with any of those cookies that are set over HTTP. What you can do is get to the ad tracking data and view your profile and your address with the HTTP cookie, which I thought was kind of rude, but you can't actually make a purchase with it. And, there, and I thought it was kind of nuts, but they obviously the designers have gone to great effort to decide what part of it is secure and what part of it's not secure and have a whole bunch of different cookies and exchanges for all that. But anyway, you can do something like this. You, you don't log in, you browse products, put them in your shopping cart, then you check out, now they ask you for personal data and payment details, and you review order data on a confirm order page. So again, you started with an anonymous token, then you added a bunch of confidential data to it, all on the same token. So if I could have fed you the attacker's token, you would now be putting all that data on the attacker's token, they can now view the confirm order page and steal your credit card number. Even though you didn't log in, you moved a token from an untrusted state to a trusted state and retained the same token. Now what's even crazier is, some see the, here, the reason why you want to always bother of doing step one here is so you could get a valid token for the app. Because a proper app has these long random numbers like we saw here, these long random numbers like this 12, DA, 1, all that jazz. But not all apps are that smart. Some of them just let you make up numbers and they'll take it, any token. So you can just make up a number, and apparently IIS and Cold Fusion actually fell for this. So I don't even need to bother with step one, I can just send you a link with a token filled in with a random number I know, 
and the app will just let you log in with that number, and now I can take over your session. So if you want to find these things, you've got to watch how session tokens go. The two vulnerabilities are when the app assigns a token to an anonymous user and upgrades their privileges, or when a user logs in and then logs in again to a different account, they retain the same token. Both of these are dangerous because there's a way I can steal a token for one session, reuse it in another, and you won't know that. Um, all right, I can hijack the session. And even if there's no login, if the token leads to any kind of trusted confidential page, that's not safe. You really should make a new token every time someone elevates their privileges. So that's the point. Um, and for defense in depth, another thing you can do mentioned in previous chapters is that per page tokens, which proves that you're actually accessing the pages in order and someone's not jumping through them. Um, then there's open redirects. This is a relatively minor vulnerability. It was true of the uh, Hackazon website that you scanned with that phone scanner back in your project, where you have a page that redirects to another page, and you can change where it goes. So this is commonly used for rickrolling, where someone clicks on the link, they're good, and somehow they end up watching this annoying video. Um, you can use it in a phishing attack. If Amazon had an open redirect, you could make a real Amazon link that goes to Amazon and then goes to the fake Amazon, and they might not notice that. Uh, but in practice, nobody bothers because people are so helpless that you don't really need to be that sneaky. You can just make a domain name that looks like Amazon. You can just have amazon.paymentsecure.com or something. That's usually what real phishing links are. They don't even bother to hide them very well because people just don't bother looking very carefully at what they're clicking. Um, so you can find open redirects, just find the three ho two redirects and the other 300 status codes. Those are all the redirects. And then um, look at them to see if they're using uh, user data to determine where they go. Here's one of the many. A meta tag is another way to do it. We used to do this all the time. You can put a meta tag in your HTML and this will redirect. Zero is the number of delays of seconds, so it'll immediately redirect to this other page. Um, you can do it with JavaScript. We did this with cross-site scripting. Just set document location to some of the URL, and it will go there. Um, so most redirects are not user controllable. They're just hard-coded because they just mean someone moved to a different server or something, and they just program some redirects. Um, but the one place they are is when it has returned to original page. Like it sends you to go do something. Like you've timed out, and you have to log in again, and then you want to return to your original page. And that's one place where they tend to just uh, have the URL, the old URL right there, or get it from McFur or somewhere foolish like that. So Hackathon has that one. When you log in, it's got up in the URL bar up there, it's got um, return URL just right there. And you can just change it to go anywhere you want. And then when you're done logging in, it'll go there. So Zap called this remote file inclusion, which is not correct. It's just an open redirect. But anyway, you can re redirect from there. So if you want to prevent this, you can do tricks to try to stop it. One thing is to not let anyone put in absolute URLs. An absolute URL is one like this that starts with HTTP. If you aren't allowed to start with HTTP or HTTPS, then every URL is relative to the current location. So this would be hackazon.samscast.info user slash whatever you put here. You couldn't get off the server. You could just go through the file system of the real app server. All right, so that's one option. Another thing is to add a specific absolute URL prefix so that they're always on your server no matter what you do. So one thing they might do is block all users applied strings that start with HTTP colon slash slash. And then you can try all the usual tricks. Case sensitivity, null byte, put a space in there. Um, omit the HTTP but start with slash slash. URL encode the HTTP, you know, use backslashes, use HTTPS, all the usual stuff. If they filtered it in some way, they might not have been careful enough to filter all the variations that will still work. Um, another thing you can do is sanitize URLs so it removes HTTP colon slash slash and any external domain. And as you know, this you can often fool by putting it in twice so it removes one and there's one left putting in stuff that's broken so it won't recognize it. You know, the usual lots of put the whole thing in there twice so it'll clean up one and leave one behind. You know, the usual stuff. Uh, so app may verify that the user supplied string starts with the right URL. So then um, you can try concealing it. Like you can put in the real URL, httpmdsec.net, and then just keep going, dot the the, the app will find that this starts with the correct domain but he won't notice that there isn't a slash here. So you're not getting anywhere. This is commonly what fishers do too. They put the name of the company, .evilmomain.com, and it looks like it's really going to that company. So various tricks here. You can put in special characters to try to trick it. 
Um, another one that was pretty fun, used for a long time to trick people, was uh, at signs. You put in like httpmicrosoft.com at yahoo.com and it will try to use, the part before the at will be interpreted as the username for a login and the part after the at is the actual domain you go to. But the part they see in the browser is the first part. So anyway, a lot of these tricks. Um, so another thing you can do is add an absolute prefix where it's going to um, append. So up here, what the user puts in for redirect is update slash update 29 and where it actually goes is http mdsec.net uploads .upload 29 What you're adding is just the suffix. This is hard code and you can't change it. It's always going to start with http mdsec.net. If they don't remember to put in the slash, then they're still vulnerable because you can just you put it, you go to dot mdattacker.net. If you're going to have a prefix, it has to go all the way to the slash. There it's not, or you're still vulnerable. Anyway. If you want to prevent these things, don't put user supply data in the target of redirect. It's much better to have a list of known choices and just choose among the known good choices. Um, if you have to, then use relative, there are various options. One option is use relative URLs in all redirects and you verify that correctly. Um, another thing to do is prepend every URL with the whole domain, with including the slash. And another thing is verify that it all starts with that domain, including the slash. Those are all pretty good defenses. And the only reason you have these vulnerabilities is the programmer attempted to do that and was sloppy and didn't get it right. I was not aware of this. This is great. Find HTML5 lets you have databases in the browser. And now you can have SQL injection in the browser on the client side. What fun that'll be. So apparently, you know, in a store, you already you can store like session cookies and you can store hidden parameters and you can store flash objects, but now apparently you want to store whole databases of stuff in the browser and use SQL to get them back. So of course, if you do that, then you can have SQL injection in the browser. So um, the point of this is you can now store data on the client side. You can run your app in offline mode where you have some kind of database that updates in offline mode. And when you connect, it'll synchronize again. So that's the idea with Joyous HTML5. So now we can steal everything from you. Because all I have to do is upload data with a posture visit. When you download it into your local database, it'll uh, inject SQL and steal the data out of it. So anyway, um, whatever you've got in that database, they can steal it. Um, then there's HTTP parameter pollution on the client side. So when you load the, your inbox, you load it with some parameters. Folder equals inbox, order equals down, size equals 20, start equals 1. Okay, that means um, that's what happens when you, then you see your message. Now, when you see your email, you can click on it to reply. And when you reply, it's going to do an action on the server, and some of these parameters like size equals 20 and start equals 1 came from the user. So, if I'm able to send you a URL and have you click a malicious link to open your inbox, I can now put in a start number of 1 percent 26 action equals delete. And what that'll do is when you try to reply to the message, it will have here start equals 1 and percent action equals delete. And then later on, you've got action equals reply. So depending on the app, it might well do the delete and not get the reply. You know, I could do parameter pollution where you have a doubly set app on the client side. All right, and then there's privacy attacks. This is in the case where someone has access to your physical computer, like in the lab. And I think the most common case of this these days is stolen cell phones and stolen laptops, where someone actually gets your physical device. Um, and of course, your device is all full of goodies. Resistant cookies, especially mobile devices, have resistant cookies that typically last forever, and someone can just steal them. Um, you have cached web content. Uh, HTTPS content is not cached by default, but HTTP content is, and it will have fragments of images, fragments of web pages, and such. You can put these tags in the uh, header of your HTTP pages to tell the browser not to cache them, but if you don't, it will. And I don't know how you can verify that it complies with these headers. I wouldn't necessarily trust it to. Um, then you've got your browsing history. Now, the, and your browsing history, as you know, can be stolen in a variety of ways. Um, if someone can get physical access to your machine, they can just click on the history button. On the web, they can do it by looking for CSS to see which links have been visited. Um, autocomplete stores things in a registry or in the file system. Uh, Firefox is notorious for this. If you use Firefox or Chrome and you store passwords, it doesn't automatically put a master password on them. So you often can just open them up and see them. Um, and you can steal autocomplete data with cross-site scripting sometimes, although there are defenses against that, 
and it's hard to do. Then there's flash cookies. These things have been around for a while. The original thing I heard about, this is one of the first ways Google would mark your machine. Even though you clear your cookies, you haven't got rid of Google because their business model relies on knowing who you are all the time, and they are very, very vigorous at making sure that you can't hide from Google. But these things are called local stored objects. They're flash in the flash. And one fun thing about them is even if you change browsers, it doesn't change the value of the flash cookies as long as the other browser has flash. You're sharing, you're sharing the same flash module as the extension in every, every browser, i.e can store custom user data. Um, in this thing called user data, just like a lot of things, user data low is where it goes in a file system or a modern Windows system. I went and looked up to see if this would apply to Edge, and apparently Edge stores data here even when you're in private browsing mode, which is what I've always wondered. One of the questions I always get in the forensic class is, what if you open the private browser mode and then you do something? Could a forensic person find out you'd been there? And I said, I'm not sure, but I bet they could, because I don't trust that, to really not store anything. And apparently it is true that Edge really does store stuff about what you're doing even when you're in private mode. Um, then HTML5 introduced a bunch of new things, session storage, database storage, and local storage. And uh, probably there's ways to steal that, but you know, no one knows yet. HTML5 isn't being used for these fancy things too much yet. Um, so if you want to prevent these things, you really shouldn't be storing anything sensitive on your machine. I mean, we talk a lot about this in the mobile device hacking class. Since your phone is going to get stolen, <laughs> You really shouldn't have secrets on the phone unless they are protected in some way by, say, encryption. Even if they're encrypted, as you've seen in this class, the attacker can often use the encrypted data without decrypting it, replay it, or mess around with blocks and manage to get some good out of it, even encrypted data they can't decrypt. Um, and you should use your cache directives to prevent the browser from storing sensitive data. Um, here's the ASP instructions and the Java commands to set these headers uh, in those languages to prevent your applet from having cache data stored in the browsers. Uh, you shouldn't use URLs to send sensitive data that's been around a long time. You shouldn't be using GET to send sensitive parameters because they'll just be sitting right in the URL and they'll end up in the log and in the favorites buttons of browsers and so on. You should sense anything sensitive with POST and you can use the autocomplete equals off attribute to prevent browsers from automatically filling in fields, uh, which is a good thing to do uh, to protect the user. And then you can attack the browser itself. Let me make sure I got the right version of this thing. I don't have the right I thought I should have some iClickers by now. Um, I grabbed the one file. So I probably got them. Uh, that's the one I want. So I probably got some iClickers so you don't fall asleep so much. There they are. Let's see if we have been there. Yeah, we have been there. All right. So let me start my iClicker receiver. All right. Yeah, come grab one. All right. Ah! Holy crap. <laughs> Sounds vicious. That's right. A dangerous dog, we better call the cops. <laughs> It's always, it's always the little ones. The little ones are always so fierce, you know. They got something to prove. Yeah. Oh, that's a pretty dangerous Johnny dog. Yeah, you very well. All right, so which one requires the developer to elevate privileges of a token? session fixation, you determine what someone's going to use for a token. Let me go back and make sure I'm right. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Session fixation is where I tell you what to use for token, and you use it. And therefore, after you get high privileges, I can get in there because I determined your supposedly random token. All right. And it's only going to work if the developer permits a token to change its privilege level. In Microsoft Windows, when you log in, 
with an administrator account, you are issued two tokens, one low privilege token and one high privilege token. And when you go through user account control to escalate, you switch to the other token. And that's the right way to do it, not to add privileges to the existing token. Anyway. All right, which one lets you replace a page with a totally different page for a single target user? response splitting. You send one request and you get two responses because I inject a whole page in the header and browsers can be tricked into believing one and not the other. All right. Which one is mostly a prank? Not serious. open redirects. You're already leaving the domain. You're not going to have access to the old cookies. It's not really clear what great harm you could do. All right, I think we've been through some of this anyway. I think I'll just keep going because we're nearly done. Yeah. All right, we're down. In fact, there's a fun demo to show you. Let me start my Windows 2008 machine. And while that comes up. Um, all right, you mentioned this. All right, so these are the things. Attacking the browser is some cute tricks. You can log keystrokes with JavaScript. And I was surprised this still works in Internet Explorer, but they have put in some defenses. So the point of this is you can write JavaScript that picks up key presses. And so you get window event key code, and then you get string from care code, you add it to a string, you can accumulate the keystrokes. This one just puts them in the status bar, but you could just as easily be sending them off to the web to some server to steal them. So I wrote that script. I just filled it in with the rest of the web page, and I ran it in Internet Explorer here. And I wanted to show you what happens when you actually run this, which is, let me just uh, launch it from zero to see if I can get it to show you the defenses. There's the script. And keylog IE. There it is. OK. So I open it with Internet Explorer. Now, notice it warns me. The information bar alerts you to security-related conditions. Internet Explorer has restricted this web page from running scripts. Microsoft doesn't like the fact that this script, I think, is not coming from a signed developer. Anyway, so it's going to say, allow blocked content. They're going to say, are you sure? And if I'm sure, now when I go here, yeah? Would you still get a warning if you were, if you put the script on your attack server or some other regular web page? Yes, I think so. Um, it, it, the question is what zone I'm in. If I'm not in the trusted zone, you'll see that warning. And you define the zones inside your browser, and that's typically your local area network or inside the same domain by default. If you don't want to see that warning, I think you have to add them to the trusted zone. Because all of the all of websites have JavaScript, and you, and you don't get the warning if you just go to a, a website like Google. Yeah. So why yeah. would you get this warning? For, for this yeah, case? it's a good question. I used to know the answer. I forget. You're right. Um, anyway, so if you type stuff in here, um, hello, you know, now it's working. It's stealing all the keystrokes you type in this page and putting them down there. So yeah, that's um, it's a good question. Exactly what Microsoft uses to determine that warning, um, and I'm not sure. I, anyway. So yeah. Can this work with conjunction with, with stored XSS? Like that's I would sure. I would think you can use the stored XSS to inject a JavaScript, and that would be fine. Yeah. I think you're right. Anyway, so um, I'm surprised that still works, but it does. All right. Although, to be fair, that browser in 2008 is a little bit old. I think it's IE8 or something. But still, it's not that old. People are still using it. Anyway, uh, that can only, now you can only capture keystrokes with this kind of thing when the window that's uh, running, when the browser window has the focus. So, however, this is a cute trick called reverse stroke jacking. If I, you have an ad on the page in a frame, yeah, it's a good name. And then, you, if you're in a frame, you can change the focus to the host 
and into the frame. So what I can do is the code in the child frame can grab the focus. You try to type in like your username and password into say Gmail, but there's an ad on the page. The ad can steal the focus. So when you type, you're not talking to the main page anymore, you're talking to the ad, and the ad can then take the keystrokes and send them back to the page above it, so you don't know this has happened. It can even hop back and forth at the rate of one per second to make the cursor blink, to make it look like you're still on the page above it. So this is you know, sort of like that clickjacking trick. You make it look like everything's fine, but it's not fine. So it's a pretty good idea. And then of course, if you want to steal browser history or, the, or your queries, you can just brute force common websites and common query strings and look for get computer styles to see the color of those links to see if they have been visited or not. And you can find websites and queries because the query goes in the URL, google.com question mark Q equals whatever you're searching for. So I can't explicitly type out what you've been searching for, but I can try a number of guesses and it all happens locally in your browser. And browsers are now super fast, so I can try thousands and millions of guesses locally. Um, I can find out what applications you've been using. And this is because if you've been going to a web app, I can find out whether you're logged in or not. Because I load an authenticated page, like Facebook's profile. You'll only see your profile if you're logged in. And I can tell by um, what you do is you write this kind of JavaScript down here, where you're going to have, it's going to load the page, and on error, it's going to analyze the page. This will always cause an error. Uh, you make a cross-domain request, it's not going to be allowed to see the response and cause an error, but the error will be different depending on what the page is. Um, so you load this page as if it's a script. Script source equals the page. It's not going to be script, so it'll give you an error, but if it actually found the page, it will specify line number and error type. And if it didn't, it'll give you a different answer. So you can tell from the answer whether this person's logged in or not. So you can make a sniffer that will tell you whether people are logged into popular websites or not. And then if they are, you can launch your next attack, like put something on their Facebook wall, make them buy something at Amazon now that I know they're logged in. It's sort of like a port scan, a sniffer to see if they're logged in. And you can do port scans. Now I've heard this for years, it is quite limited, but you can do port scans from inside a browser. What you can do is you can force it, if you can inject JavaScript, you can make it make requests, HTTP requests. And you can put a colon, you can change the port number in the request. So you can't send sins to arbitrary ports, but you can send entire HTTP gets to arbitrary ports. Now that might seem useless, but it will find all the web servers in your environment, like the web administration panel of the router and things like that. Um, so that's one thing it will do. Um, most browsers will not let you go to port 25. You can't put a colon 25. They know a few copy ports and block them, but a lot of other ports are available. Um, so after your port scan has identified a host running HTTP server, you can then try to fingerprint them. For example, if you want to find Netgear routers, you just look for their fav icon that has this distinctive name. And there are similar things for most uh, web administration panels. You can try these and you'll know if you find this image, that means it's, you know what branded device it is and you know what it is. And once you have that, you can um, either try its default name and password or you can just exploit known vulnerabilities. And there's a ton of known vulnerabilities of home routers and a lot of other devices. Um, now, in all these cases, you can issue requests, but you can't see responses, but that's often good enough because it does things like turn off the firewall, change the password, so on. Um, you can send arbitrary binary content to a port, but it's gonna start with an HTTP header. Now, I would think that would make it useless, but apparently there are a lot of apps out there that will let you send arbitrary garbage before the request and still work, which is kind of rude. I mean, I, I'm used to like compiled languages where it just has to be perfect. If anything is wrong, eh. Web services don't seem to be that way. They seem to take garbage input and try to clean it up and use it anyway. Um, so if you have a non-HTTP service running on a port that's not blocked by a browser and it tolerates unexpected headers, now I can send requests to that server. Since browsers also tolerate response, those that don't have valid HTTP headers, I can now bounce stuff off that non-HTTP service back into the browser. And it turns out that if, if I go to a server on port 80, and then I go to a server on port 80, 80, 88, it does not make that distinction in the cookies. It thinks I'm still on the same domain. It doesn't include the port number in the domain. So that means I can bounce an attack, a script to the non-HTTP service 
and in reply can read cookies for the domain and transmit them to the attacker. This, this whole thing about the same origin policy, I've heard Dan Kaminsky go on about it at DEF CON, the same origin policy is pretty miserable security because it's really hard to define exactly what an origin is. Is the HTTPS and the HTTP page from the same domain, the same domain, same origin or not? And so on you go. There are all these edge cases that let you sneak things out. And then of course there's browser bugs. Most of the bugs are in extensions to browsers, but there's also browser bugs. So Java bugs have been so bad that you can perform arbitrary two-way communication to any server. Um, and then there's DNS rebinding. This is a cute trick. I've heard about it a lot. Um, what you do, I have a malicious website and I also have a malicious authoritative DNS server. So I get my DNS server to tell you lies. So you go to my page and when you load my page, it has Ajax that makes further requests and I lie to you about the IP address of the secondary requests. So you now go and request the target server. Your browser thinks it's still in my domain. So this is your cross origin policy, the same origin policy does not block this request. So you go to my page, samscottish.info, then my browser, uh, Ajax, starts telling you, make more probes. I change the IP address, and those probes actually go to Facebook. Now, your browser will let you see the responses, because Facebook is apparently part of samscottish.info now, but it'll have to be pretty stupid to fall for this, because the requests will have a host name of samscottish.info in them going into Facebook. So. This is sort of like a null scan. It sounds kind of cute, but in fact, it doesn't tell you much. You'd have to have, but anyway, um, the, this is a way to defeat the same origin policy, but it does create sort of malformed requests. So the host parameter will point to the wrong thing. The requests, when it sends those requests, it will not put the Facebook cookies in them. It'll put the samsung.info cookies in them because your browser thinks it's in my domain. So it won't be actually be able to authenticate at Facebook. So basically, you'll only get the information from Facebook that I could have got by just going there directly as a stranger. So this is sounds cute, but it's actually not that useful. The only time you want to use it is for pivoting. When you're limited to get inside a company and you have to you can only reach that server from inside. Then you could send some kind of traffic to that server from the inside with this trick. Um, but it's pretty limited. Anyway, there's browser exploitation frameworks. I tried to make beef projects for some of my classes. A lot of people went on about how great beef was. Beef is in Kali. But every time I tried to I've tried to write projects in beef it has about 30 attacks, only like five of them actually work. And most of them don't do anything interesting because they're very, very specific and they get patched really fast. So um, I was not able to actually have much fun with beef. You can do a couple demos, but um, most of the stuff you want to do doesn't actually work. Yeah? Uh, just, I tried um, beef with uh, this script, uh, beef shank. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was supposed to be, um, the beef injection framework or something like that, something hilarious with the name. But yeah. um, it, it, the way it was supposed to work was it was supposed to inject every single non-encoded uh, non or non-encrypted HTTP request and hook any browser on any machine in yeah. the lab and it didn't work. Yeah, so I mean, you can, you, can, you can definitely, from a man in the middle position, you can definitely add script to responses over HTTP and run JavaScript in people's browser. That just turns out to be less fun than you think it would be in practice um, because they keep patching what it can do. The really, really exciting things I didn't find them work. But in principle, you can log keystrokes, hijack the session, fingerprint the browser, perform port scans in a very limited way, attack other web applications in a limited way, and brute force their history and such. These are pretty good, but they, in practice, these aren't anything like as good as like getting a Metasploit shell. Then you can really go to town. Um, so anyway, man in the middle attacks are really devastating. If you can actually get between the client and the server, they're basically hosed. You can just lie to their browser and trick them. I was surprised. I mean, obviously, if you're using plain text protocols, you can now steal the passwords and cookies and alter them, do anything you want. But even if you're using HTTPS, it really doesn't do them much good. Because even though, um, if you have apps like Amazon, you use HTTP and HTTPS, then I can go to the HTTP part and use those requests and change the response to set the cookies. So I can control your cookies. Um, and if you have a page that loads script over HTTP, this I thought was pretty good. Um, so your page loads scripts from their server over HTTP. So I use a 302 redirect to make you load that page over HTTPS. And many servers will deliver it over HTTPS. Then you're now getting access to the HTTPS cookies and apparently, at least when your book was written, it was true that you could have an HTTPS page that loaded script over HTTP and it would not warn you with one of those pop-ups saying this page contains both secure and insecure elements. I hope it's fixed now. 
But if that's true, then you could inject malicious script in the HTTP, and they would like you to have access to the HTTPS cookies. Yeah? How would that work if you don't have the certificate? You load the real page from the real server or HTTPS, and then when they send the HTTP request to load the script, you tamper with that. That's the point. His, that, his point is you can have a code, a page which loads HTTP, and when you load the whole page or HTTPS, it will not complain, and then fetch that one resource or HTTP. This is not supposed to happen, and it probably it's fixed by now. But apparently it's true at one time. So this happens when the page has HTTP dependencies? Yes. And so um, you know, the HTTPS only domains like Google, where everything is now HTTPS. You'd think they're safe, but they aren't, because all I have to do is wait until you make an HTTP request for some other domain, and then I can redirect you, and then I can lie in the response. I can redirect you to what you think is Google, and then when you send an HTTP request to Google, which it will ignore, I'll just reply for my man in the middle and set cookies and put script on and things like that. It's pretty gruesome. And so the only way, he was talking about exotic ways to protect yourself from this, like Joanna Bruce Kalska might, where you'd actually try to have a separate browser just for financial processing and not use it for social network or anything. But the fact is, every browser now sends HTTP requests like crazy for updating plugins and checking things, a Dropbox, all sorts of foolish things are coming out of your browser when you didn't mean it to. It's essentially impossible to have a browser that doesn't send any HTTP traffic at all. And if it sends any at all, I can trick it if I'm in the middle. Now, one defense that would save you, I think, and it might be, this is what Google's been talking about for Chrome, and I don't know how perfect it is, but the idea is Chrome would know for the top 1,000 websites whether they should be secure or not. And it just won't accept anything about Google that's insecure because it knows everything should be secure. And then even if I'm in the middle trying to trick it into loading insecure stuff from, from Chrome, uh, presumably that would stop it. But no other browser I know is making much effort to go that way, but that's, that's one way to go. You really ought to know not to accept mixed content. That's why a lot of the purists say we should just be using HTTPS all the time everywhere, and a whole bunch of these problems would be fixed. And someday we'll be there. Anyway, so you can set or update a cookie. This is another terrible thing. If you have a secure-only cookie set by HTTPS, you can modify the value with HTTP, and the browser will take it. That's what he says. That's, again, I'd like to test this stuff. I haven't made a demo. That sounds terrible, but apparently it's true. Um, there's browser extensions, of course, that don't separate HTTP and HTTPS. So if that happens, you can use such an extension to read or write across that boundary. And, uh, and that's it. I got a few more eye clickers. All right, so what kind of persistent data is not created for HTTPS pages? All right, it doesn't get cached. All right. So that's one good thing, anyway. All right. What, which data is created by a browser plugin? Those are the locally stored objects. Those are flash cookies. Good, all right. All right. Which one will let you steal a browser history? All right, and that's the first one, get computer style, lets you ask the browser what color is this link, and that'll tell you whether that's been visited. All right. All right, which one allows a script in a frame to grab input from the containing frame?
All right, and that's reverse stroke jacking, which could have won a prize for the greatest name. There was a, a hacking tool called Vomit that won an award for like the worst name of a tool that, that uh, year. It was uh, something that would snoop over e uh, telephone calls on the internet. It was voice over misconfigured internet telephone. <laughs> anyway. Um, but this would have been a contender, I think. All right, so, all right. Which attack is only possible for services that ignore extra data? The last one, exploiting a non-HTTP service from a browser requires sending it HTTP requests, which is then ignores, which is kind of nuts. You know, one fundamental thing I've heard a million times in the book is don't sanitize data and continue to use it. If something is wrong, send an error message and say, try again. Don't try to clean it up and continue to use it. That's just asking for all this stuff, but, but somehow people don't get it. Anyway, I'm going to stop the recording, and uh, I know Tony has a demo. So let me, let's take like a five minute break, pick up a quarter after, and then we'll look at the, uh, Tony's demo of his snort on a Raspberry Pi, I think, which would be pretty cool. One thing I missed about um, the, what's it call it, about the freaking voice and tap was it does call out to some weird IPs. 